Hi friends, hope you're all doing well and I'm back again with the fifth iteration or the fifth version of my own loud thinking about some of the paradigms which have shifted or changed in the last 20 years that I have been involved in the field of intensive care medicine. Today, I probably will think about or talk about nutrition as it has evolved, ICU nutrition to say how it has evolved over the last 20 years uh, in intensive care. Conceptually, 20-25 years ago, ICU nutrition was probably thought of as a supportive or a cor uh, corollary to what's going on in the intensive care unit and it's never got as, never did get as much importance as fluids or vasopressors or antimicrobial therapy, acid-based balance and renal replacement therapy. But as we have understood the nuances of ICU nutrition, the importance of sarcopenia, the loss of muscle mass, the means of measuring it, which are all paradigm shifts which have happened, the role of nutrition as an intervention, as a therapy, has probably emerged as one of the big paradigms in intensive care. And you don't, the people who prescribe nutrition uh, have changed from the nutritionist to trained and informed ICU clinicians who take the responsibility of prescribing ICU nutrition. Today, the whole concept of tailoring the nutritional requirements of the patient, formulating it and delivering it in a way that the acceptable number of calories and the targets are achieved for a good proportion of patients. And the target of nutritional support that is achieved among intensive care patients has become a quality indicator if you want to understand that, the importance in intensive care. So that's been one of the major paradigm shifts where nutrition has progressed from a also ran or a 12th man on the field to a impact player uh, uh, in the intensive care unit. 20 years ago, the moment somebody did not tolerate enteral nutrition for 24 hours or 48 hours, we definitely used to think about parental nutrition. So there are two paradigms here which we need to consider. One, how, how long can an intensive care patient be starved or be deprived of any form of nutritional support and what adverse effect it has on the ultimate outcome of these patients. And whether early initiation of parental nutrition is necessary for these patients. Yes, there are clearly established guidelines for enteral and parental nutrition, but previously the kind of panic that need, used to set in among intensivists and if you could not feed your patient in the first 48 hours is no longer valid. In fact, patients who have not been fed up to four days and maybe five do not do worse than those who have been initiated on enteral feeds in the first 48 hours. So. The paradigm has shifted with early aggressive, early aggressive enteral nutrition or early aggressive initiation of nutritional support plus or minus parental nutrition to a more guarded, more measured approach to enteral feeding and ensure that whatever you deliver is tolerated and absorbed by the patient. We don't call nutrition as nutritional support anymore. It's just not about carbohydrates, fats and proteins that you need to look at. The whole paradigm of ICU nutrition has now become metabolic support. So how is the nutritional composition going to impact the inflammatory pathology? How is it going to impact the biomarkers of inflammation? How is it going to impact the biomarkers of coagulation? What, what is it going to do to the volume status of the individual? What is it going to do to the electrolyte status of the individual? All these questions are now being routinely answered while prescribing nutrition. So nutrition while providing the energy to the patient is also part of the metabolic support which a critically ill patient actually deserves. That's again been a major paradigm shift. Previously, we used to go with standard formulae of 25 kilocalories or roundabouts and try to achieve those targets. But that one size fits all hypothesis has actually now failed to find muster among practitioners in intensive care medicine. 
nutritional assessment by whatever tools we had and whatever tools we have at this point of time which was usually ignored initially has now become central to planning the therapy of the patient while you manipulate the ventilator for uh, oxygenation and ventilation you titrate the fluids you look at the ultrasound you you use the uh, labs to optimize your uh, antimicrobial therapy similarly the day to day dynamics of assessment of nutrition the changes of the markers of nutritional adequacy or inadequacy have become integral to daily checklist for intensive care patients so this nutritional assessment by various tools by thick measurements and parameters has become an integral part utilizing the uh, harris benedict equation and integrating it into mechanical ventilation has been a major paradigm shift and we are now able to understand how our nutritional strategy is impacting the metabolic burden on the patient and how you may be actually uh, without your knowledge or understanding be overloading the patient with high metabolic load so understanding this metabolic requirement of the patient and assessment of this metabolic requirement along with the nutritional assessment has been a major paradigm shift in the way icu nutrition has progressed over the last 20 years parenteral nutrition has also come in gone out come in gone out in the intensive care unit there are multiple formulations available there are central formulations available there are peripheral formulations available based on their osmolarity so you have the choice of choosing and picking your parenteral nutrition formula and composition and delivering it the way you want into the patients but the original aggression with which parenteral nutrition was used is no longer uh, being practiced you have a more balanced approach to the use or judicious use of parenteral nutrition and avoiding overfeeding of these patients and it has also been understood that over aggressive use of parenteral nutrition apart from producing the infectious complications which we all know about also produces a lot of metabolic load on these patients and it can also impact the coagulation status and the immunity of these patients so an understanding of what parental nutrition can do how to make it safer how to tailor it to individual patients has been a paradigm shift in the field of icu nutrition another area where i think we made some progress and a lot of publications have come in is about patients who are in shock how you should feed them you should you completely refrain from feeding these patients or you feed them normal calories or you feed them in a hypocaloric sort of way what is it that we have tried to achieve what is it that we are trying to achieve how much of our targets can we achieve in these patients is it okay to completely keep them off feeds completely until the shock reverses at what shock level do you can you initiate feeds these are paradigms which were not answered till recently until the nutriria study and then the more recently published nutriria 3 study have attempted to answer in fact hypocaloric feeding even as low as 600 calories per day is associated with better shock reversal earlier shock reversal length shorter length of mechanical ventilation shorter length of icu stay and to some extent better survival among critically ill patients my own student dr kiran worked on this topic last year during his during his super specialty thesis and his numbers also seem to be suggesting that feeding these patients up to 600 calories in the intensive care unit when they are on moderate dose of norepinephrine like one less than a mic uh, per minute is feasible it is definitely safe and is associated with better outcomes among patients with sepsis and septic shock who are on vasopressor therapy so shock per se blanket is not a contraindication for feeding these patients so how you feed these patients with what you feed these patients and at what rate is something we need to understand as a major paradigm shift acute illness definitely warrants some major attention to the uh, nutritional composition but the concept of chronic critical illness those who are confined to the bed because of spinal cord injuries because of neuropathies several other problems uh, who who keep on adding their nutritional deficiencies 
uh, which need to be addressed by the intensivists has also come as a major paradigm shift. Possibly this paradigm has shifted or has emerged because we are now crossing the boundaries of the ICU and stepping out and giving the long term care to critically ill patients and chronic critical illness is one of them. The need for continuing active nutritional support post discharge as a recognition as an entity and as a prescription is probably a major paradigm shift which we have found among patients in the intensive care unit. The targets for nutritional support as I mentioned earlier have also now become better defined. The paradigm has shifted uh, from overfeeding or underfeeding to what we can call as target based, target based nutrition with well defined nutritional protocols. What the role of protein and how much protein you give to these patients, what is the type of protein you give to these patients has also been a good paradigm shift in among intensive care patients. Hypocaloric feeding is no longer frowned upon and it is in fact being advocated for those patients who cannot tolerate the full caloric feeds in the intensive care unit. There used to be a debate that continuous feeding is superior to bolus feeding um, and those patients who are fed with bolus feeds tend to have more interruptions in their feeding pattern, feeding schedules than those who are continuously fed. Uh, but that has not actually uh, shown in a major randomized control trial to improve any outcomes. Similar debates have raged between formula feed versus kitchen feeds. Hospitals which have good laminar flow setups which can manufacture or prepare their own kitchen feeds in a hygienic and safe way have proven and shown that kitchen feeds are probably comparable to formula feeds. But on certain aspects like trace elements certain aspects like certain vitamin deficiencies are probably less commonly encountered for those patients who are fed with a formula diet than those patients who are fed with a kitchen based diet. We also used to be very obsessed uh, with measuring the gastric residual volume and we used to aspirate the nasogastric tube before every feed and then hold it when a fixed amount of a uh, fixed amount of uh, GRV was noted. But the relevance of the gastric residual volume as a marker of feed intolerance has dwindled and that has been a paradigm shift in the intensive care unit. You still measure the gastric residual volumes maybe three or four times a day, but that's not a marker of dysfunctional gut. That brings us back to that old adage that if the gut is working, use it and if it's not working, make it work. So the feeding techniques uh, are no longer focused on GRV based interruptions on feeding um, and, the, uh, and there, was, there is no uh, enthusiasm now for putting all patients who have moderate amounts of GRVs on nasojejunal feeding. There are specific indications for nasojejunal feeding but the gastric route seems to be the preferred route of feeding and that's been a major advancement and recognition over the last 20 years. Micronutrient deficiencies again have we all know about selenium and zinc deficiencies for a long time but several other micronutrient deficiencies have also cropped up uh, in the uh, last 20 years which now you can correct them and you know which trace element and which micronutrient contributes to what delays and what derangements in a critically ill patient. That again has been a major paradigm shift and evolution of ICU nutrition as a mainstream topic for discussion amongst critical care fraternity. The number of publications that happen annually on ICU nutrition the emerging knowledge on the nuances and the advancements on ICU nutrition has probably been a major paradigm shift uh, in terms of ICU nutrition. So essentially we have understood when to feed patients. We, we, we also have understood that it is not bad to keep them unfed for at least 72 to 96 hours. We know that hypocaloric feeding is possible. Shock patients need not always be starved. Micronutrient deficiencies can now be quantified. New, the measure anthropometric and other measurements are now available which will guide you for our therapy. Very conservative and balanced use of parental nutrition. 
and of course the non reliance on gastric residual volumes as the markers of feed tolerance or intolerance are probably some of the paradigm shifts which have emerged so friends these are some of my thoughts about the paradigm shifts that have happened in the field of icu nutrition please do think about it if you find that i have missed something or you think there's some paradigm that has shifted please do feel to communicate with me thank you very much and have a good day bye bye